Well, it's a special treat to have your son-in-law bless his mother-in-law's mouth. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> that, that's really, that, I'm wrecked now. Oh, there. Sorry. <clears throat> It's here, but it's not. Oh, thank thank the Lord. Well, good morning. Uh, For those of you who don't know me, my name is Claire Ingalls. We've been part of this church for a great long time, and we're happy. I'm happy to be back with you today. Terry and I have just returned from a month away. We've been serving in the church and and the community in Zambia, Africa, and uh, we also had a little bit of time in Scotland afterwards, and the, the group of us that went are going to be sharing a little bit later on, so... But if you want to know more about the things that we did, please feel free to give us a call. But Hart asked me to continue on today on his series from 1 Timothy. And today we're looking at... Oh, dear. Yeah, there we go. Today we're looking at chapter 4, verses 1 to 10. So I have them on the screen, but if you want to uh, turn with them uh, with me in your Bibles, you're welcome to do that. Here we see the, the Apostle Paul, and he's writing to a young minister, his friend Timothy, and he's writing him <clears throat> some words of encouragement and some words of instruction. And we see that 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 scripture today plays that same role in the church today. You know, when we read the scriptures, it's as if we've, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church today and to his friends and the community here. So let's just read uh, the verses. This is the NIV version. <clears throat> the, clear, the Spirit clearly says that in the later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, because it's consecrated by the word of God and prayer. If you point these things out to your brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished in the truths of faith and of good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training has some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance, and that's why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. So this is the scripture that Hart wanted us to look at and continuing on in our series. I've titled today's message, uh, The The Road Less Traveled. So to be sure, um, there's many of you that have heard the famous poem by Robert Frost. He wrote it in the 1920s, and the, the poem is called The Road Not Taken. And here I just put up the last stanza, and it says, Somewhere, ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled, and that has made all the difference. So today I want to talk about the two roads that uh, the Apostle Paul is, is actually speaking of. He, he's... Um, The first road he talks about is the warnings against false teachers, and the second road is the road of the good servant of Jesus Christ. So firstly, I want to unpack those two roads. The first road... hmm, The first road is the road to destruction. And um, the Apostle Paul uh, is... uh, He's teaching about, uh, he's being being very concerned about in the later days that there will be people that will fall away. And I just want to be clear that the people that will fall away in the time that Paul was speaking to Timothy are the same people that fall away today. You know, we are often deceived today, not just back 
in the t days of the early church, we become deceived today, that we must be watchful all the time for false teachers and false doctrine. And that, false, that falsity or that deception is intended and it's purposeful. It's not accidental. It's purposeful and it's intended to steal our faith. It's intended to <clears throat> put d these thoughts into our mind where we would doubt. Sorry, could I just have that water? <clears throat> where we begin to doubt our salvation and, uh, and fall away. And this deception, it comes at, with intention from a very real enemy. And this enemy, oh, sorry, there's the deception. And this enemy is in complete opposition to the kingdom of God. You know, did you know that uh, deception, it doesn't come in announcing itself. It never comes in saying, oh, I'm going to tell you a lie. I'm going to lead you astray. It comes in like a wolf in sheep's clothing. The scripture talks to us about that. But it's like today it comes in in different kinds of camouflage. In 2 Corinthians, we read about, um, you can read about Satan when he comes in and he masquerades himself. There's the, all sorts of masquerades going on in the world today. You know, the enemy would have us all remain this, the catchphrase of the day is open-minded. Oh, just become open-minded so that you can take in all these other things and, and see it all for what it is. I encourage you to really do see it all for what it is. It's deception. It's lies. The enemy of the light would have the children of God remain open-minded uh, and be influenced by the things of this world. Some of the ways that the enemy is influencing us today. I'm, I'm sure that many of you know there's lots of different ways that we be get influenced. And they're not announced. It's not like there's a big flash on the screen that says, oh, this is the enemy speaking. But it comes into me in forms of movies or books. Maybe, maybe you're the same way. I'm reading along in this book and I think, oh, it's, it's yeah, it's not so bad. It, maybe it has bad attitudes, but it's not, not as bad as some of the others. Or maybe you're watching a movie and that scene comes on. You know that scene where you, you are really hoping that no one's in the room or no one notices that you're in the theater seeing that scene? And there's, maybe there's violence in the TV show. And you go, oh, well, it, it's got a good story. The, it, I'll just close my eyes. But those are ways that we're becoming deceived in the things of the world. What about the commercials on TV? These are the things that get me the most. I'm watching a perfectly good show, and I'm thinking that, I, yeah, I've done, chucked all my bases, and I've got all that all covered. And then, bam, a commercial comes on, and it totally offends my spirit. Has anyone else had that problem? It's just a commercial. And we think, oh, well, that's not the show I was really watching. But you know, people, we're becoming influenced by those things that we allow into our lives. We're becoming deceives, deceived. So what do you do about those things? Do you shake them off? Do you say, oh, well, whatever. I'm not, not going to live that way. Do you just shake it off? How about this? What if it's, I asked, had to ask my husband the details of this, but what if it's overtime in the seventh game of the finals of the Stanley Cup? Do you turn it off because some com commercial offends you? Do you? Come on, be honest. Put one hand up if anybody turns it off because the commercial offends them. Yeah, I thought so. The young ones, because they're not deceived yet. <laughs> so we are all allowing ourselves to be deceived. We're all allowing those small influences into our lives every day. So the first re uh, step on the road to destruction is to allow ourselves to be influenced by the worldly things around us and falling for that deception. The next road on the road to destruction oh dear, is de being desensitized. In verse, uh, oh, sorry, uh, there are many things that the children of God are deceived about. That's true. We are deceived all the time. But the most frightening thing to me is that the desensitization of the things of this world. Let me explain. In verse 2, Paul talks about the con our, about, tells about consciences, say that again, consciences that have been seared as with a hot iron. Um, you know, this doesn't happen to just the hypocritical liars. Paul mentions this searing, 
and it can happen to any one of us. The searing is, uh, um, is, is you know, when, when you're seared, has anyone had a burn before? You know, you, you burn yourself with a hot iron or you've burned yourself on the stove. When you burn yourself, when you're seared, you know that you lose feeling in that area. You can't feel. Uh, yes, you feel the, the pain of the burn. But when it's, when it's healed and the scars underneath there, you've lost feeling in that area. Apostle Paul is talking about people whose flesh has been, uh, 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 when flesh is seared with a hot iron, you know, we're becoming seared and we're becoming desensitized to horror and to violence in our world today. I, uh, I did a quick Google search and this is a staggering statistic. It says that by a, an average American, I'm going to say Canadian because we're pretty much similar culture, it says the average American child will see 200,000 acts of violence and 16,000 murders on TV alone by the age of 18. I'm telling you, that's a desensitization for sure. Um, even more shocking, most of the violent acts on TV, they are uh, perpetrated as, um, as a way that the characters solve their problems. They're also accompanied by humor. This is a desensitization. This is the, the road to destruction that the Apostle Paul was war warning about. You know, we're being deceived and we're being desensitized. When this happens, we become passive non-thinkers, mindlessly drinking in the things that are thrown at us, that come at us every day, just from living a perfectly harmless, normal life here in little old Penticton. Those things steal our joy, and they cause us to gain gratification from living for pleasure rather than pursuing godliness. In, in, in verse 3, the Apostle Paul cautions about the demands of religiosity. Religiosities. That's just a fancy word for talking about excessive rules. I just added the, I just wanted to do the D's here. So the demands that we put on here, they're excessive rules that we put on ourselves and we put on our, each other. And why do we do that? We often do that because of, we want to put on the appearance of godliness or holiness. So we put these rules on ourselves and say, oh, well, I don't do this. Oh, and I never go there, and I don't read or watch that. And the, all these rules are put on us, and they're a means of us controlling ourselves. In, uh, in Colossians 2, verse 20 to 23, it says, uh, Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit yourself to those rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, these rules, which have, have to do with the things that are all d destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Those rules, like the Pharisees in, in the time of Jesus, those rules are put on us to keep us in control. The, the verses, um, they show us that we can't reach up to God by following rules. Like we can't reach up to God by self-denial. We can't reach up to God by observing rituals, and we can't even reach up to God by practicing religion. Did you know that? The only way that you can reach out to God is by gaining your, your godliness and by pursuing his word and his truth. So Paul is not saying here in verse 3 that, um, uh, that all rules are bad. He's just saying that keeping rules and living up to the demands will not take our sins away. And they, are, they, and they won't give us salvation by, by following those rules. The only thing that gives us salvation is our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. In, um, in, in verse 3, Paul specifically talking about uh, the practice of abstaining from marriage and from certain foods. Today, when we look at that verse, we actually think that he's, he's um, referring to these things that are rules that would cause us to control our flesh, right? Just to control our flesh. And if, you were, if you've taken the most recent VBI course, you would recognize this as um, Gnosticism, and that's the belief that all the thing of the flesh is bad, and only the things that are of the spirit are good, okay? So um, 
I'm just going to continue on here. There's, there's lots to learn about Gnosticism, but um, the flesh is not bad. The flesh is not bad. So um, essentially, though, following rules in order to control yourself or your environment is a slippery slope. Those people that struggle with addiction will, will attest to that. You can't just control your environment and your flesh and think that you're going to overcome those issues. The key to a relationship with God the Father is not about rule adherence. It's not about living up to the demands that we place on ourselves or on others. But true faith requires that we trust in the things that are not seen in black and white. For I, I, I'm a black and white thinker. I think things, you know, they're, they're all about living in the box. And if, if you show me the box, I will live within the constraints of that box, and I will happily live there because I feel safe there. But you know, it's the things that aren't seen in black and white. Those are about. Those are what living for Christ is about. Relationship with God is all about resisting the need to try to earn His favor by external performance, by living up to rules or demands or things like that. But, but relying totally on faith, totally by faith, that we are fully forgiven regardless of what we can do. There's nothing we can do to earn our forgiveness and to earn our salvation. So just a quick note here that this verse does not teach that we're never to give up things for a season. If you're wanting to give up TV, if you're wanting to give up fast food or coffee or Facebook, or even, I don't recommend this, but if you're wanting to give up chocolate, for like just for a, a small time to to <laughs> fast from that, uh, just to gain more relationship with God and devote yourself to prayer, then I, I totally recommend that you do that. Go ahead, but don't prescribe it to your neighbor as a way of making yourself feel more holy. Do you understand? Just because I am I am so holy that I'm not going to eat chocolate for thirty minutes. And y'all, when you all eat chocolate, then you're less holy than I am. Do you understand? I know that's an exaggeration, but that's what we're doing when we're saying, oh, well, I don't do this because I'm so holy. Or why are you still doing that? Don't you know that God says? Don't be throwing around that, all shooting on people. Don't be doing that. So verse 4 goes on to say that everything is created good. It, it, everybody knows that. Genesis 1, God created all things, and then he said... Together, it was good. Yeah. So God created all things. And we talk, we sang today about all things. All things work together for my good, for your good. If you open the Bible to the very beginning of Genesis, you would see that. What did God say? He said it was good. So the purpose of God's creation is to bring glory to the creator. True? You agree with that? So we see with our, our eyes that all things were good. When God said it was good, he said all things. That included you and I. He said that after you and I were created. He saw that we were all good. So the purpose of God's creation is to bring him glory. You see, in God, God's eyes, we're all equal and all things are good. So we shouldn't abstain from certain things just because we put on the religiosity or the rules on ourselves. I'm saying that you're free to enjoy all things. That includes all of creation, even food, even sports, even entertainment, as long as it glorifies the one that created it. That's the key. If you're enjoying something and you're not giving uh, glory to the one who created it, then something is perverted. Something is wrong inside of you. And you need to recognize that. Seeking pleasure from those things is okay as long as those things don't become your God, your small letter G, God. Do you understand? So what's the right way to receive those things? In, in, uh, I don't have it there. But it, in the verse it says, the right way to receive all of these things is with thanksgiving. We read that uh, if we give God the glory and if we give him thanksgiving for all things, then all things are okay. Um, send, you know, if, you, if you've got friends that are out there doing things in the Okanagan and enjoying the beautiful country, mountain biking and snowboarding and running and swimming and doing all those things, they're all, it's easy to say, oh, that's all God. That's created for him. 
and that's all are created by him and that's all for our pleasure and all for for our enjoyment that's true just remember to give it to give thanks to him who created it all so there are th- a few things that you you can enjoy that then become permit uh, perverted or wrong you know the, the good food out there I love some really good food but gluttony is a sin um, I, I love my husband and I love my family but lust is a sin I love my life and I enjoy life and to the fullest but murder and abuse is a sin so you know all these things even though they're created by God they can be perverted by our enemy the point is not to be preoccupied or obsessed with the pleasures of the gifts that God's given, but instead give glory to the giver of those gifts. Okay, moving on. So the next road that I wanted to talk about is the road to eternity. Now this is the easy road. This is the life-giving road. And if you've put your faith in Christ, you know about that. We're here this Sunday morning. There's, there's a lot of things to celebrate because you're here this, morning, this Sunday morning. Now, I, I want you to think about it, but not for too long. <laughs> there are people out there. <laughs> they're enjoying the beautiful sunshine. Maybe they're uh, catching a few more winks of, of sleep. That's all really good. But um, they're, you're here. You're here. You're here to be nourished by the Word of God. And that's something to celebrate and to recognize. Clearly, we were nourished by that great breakfast. Thank you, Linda. Where are you? Uh, She's not here, but Linda made this beautiful breakfast. Thank you. And we're here to be nourished by that great breakfast, but we're also here to be nourished by the Word of God. That requires discipline. You disciplined yourself to come here and hear his word and to commune with his people this morning. The word of God is here to inform and to educate us. And you, the discipline that you showed by coming here is really important. It's like if, uh, if you go out in the world today and you don't discipline yourself with the scripture, it's like going in to take a test without ever opening a book. It's like going to, to uh, run a race without ever training. You know, I, I know a little bit about um, training through osmosis. <laughs> My husband is an athlete. He, he's done 28 races, and he'll tell 28 triathlons in his uh, short life. <laughs> he, will, he will tell you that training is really important. It's really important to prepare yourself for the race ahead. And if you don't prepare yourself, then you can't stand the test of time. You won't be successful in the race, and you likely, at, at his age, hurt himself. The goal of our discipline is that we would become more like Jesus. I'm just going to bring the message to the, my final point, going further on to the, the whole metaphor about uh, training. You also have to feed yourself a, a rich diet, a healthy diet, where, um, where you are filling yourself with the Word of God and being nourished by it. If you read in, um, hmm, where do I have that? Uh, Psalm 119, 103, how sweet are your words, they're like t- honey in my mouth, the taste of them. So, you know, the, the word of God is sweet and it's nourishing, and, and the Apostle Paul was talking about that. So bringing the message to a close here, the road to eternity it also it requires diligence. You know, uh, in verse 10, it talks about laboring and striving. For me, it's not about striving in my own strength. We, we were saying this morning about finding our strength in the shadow of his wings. Um, Philippians 2.13 reminds us that the God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his purpose. God works in you to fulfill his purpose. We don't have to do things in our own strength. Yeah, you have to run the race in your own strength in the physical, but in the spiritual, we don't have to do it on our own. We can rely on the word of God and on his favor to help us to um, complete the task, to complete the race. So in, in striving down these two roads, laboring and striving down these two roads, remember to have diligence and know that you don't have to do it on your own. Um, as we diligently press into the word of God, we gain our strength our spiritual strength, not just muscle, not just brawn to finish the race. On the walls of my gym, in my house, I have written, don't wish for it, work for it. 
Yeah. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Remember, I just came from it in the African churches, so we can get lots of amens for that. Don't wish for it, work for it. Today, if you've put your faith in the living God, be encouraged to not grow weary in working hard. The true Christian life requires discipline, it requires diet, and it requires diligence. The right perspective is to remember that our prize is assured. We, the cross 200, no, 2,000 years ago assured that we are going to cross that finish line. We are going to be approved. So you don't have to strive and worry about it. Um, God has already purchased the victory for those who believe. The only thing that's left for us is to go having hope in the living God and live in the knowledge that his road, his road leads to eternity. In the words of Robert Frost, my choice in the end, it says, and that choice made all the difference. The choice that you make today, the, mo the choice that you make this day at lunch or this evening when you're watching TV makes all the difference. Every little thing. You know, the enemy gains his stronghold little bit by little bit. It's just not overnight black and white. It's small things that cause us to be desensitized to the things of this world. So make the right choice on the road and... Um, Recognize that if you find yourself going down the wrong, the wrong road, uh, God allows U-turns. If you find yourself on that road to destruction, turn around. Seek what's right and what's true and what's uh, worthy in your life and ask him to help you find the road again. So I just want to ask the worship team to come up, and we'll uh, close with a song. If, this, uh, if today you find yourself in the middle of a road that is not giving glory to God and is not leading you to the path of um, the road to eternity, and you'd like to receive some prayer, we're here for you. We want you to uh, not go away from this place feeling discouraged, but to instead feel encouraged and to feel lifted up and nourished from this great breakfast and from our time together. So please come and receive prayer. If any of you, as I've been speaking or during the worship time, have received a word from God that you believe is for the whole church, I encourage you to come up and we'll and give time for you to share that as well. So maybe you want to do that.